Good morning, New Beginnings Community Church. How many of you are ready to worship the living God? Today we pray that the Spirit of the living God fall upon His people. Come Holy Spirit with your presence, with your life. Release every burden, break every chain that binds us. We shake off those bands this morning and we are here to worship the living God. We thank you that today faith rises in God's people in the name of Jesus.
rescue my sin was heavy The chains would break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan But you hold me, citizen of heaven
to sing on a love song. Yes, just release your sound to the ears of heaven.
Just one chief and a man's purpose to see you grow me or oh, put me anywhere just put your glory in me I'll serve you anywhere just need to see your beauty
Glory that in all. 
and amen. The Bible tells us that we have the glory of God within this earth and vessel. And it's a glory that abides inside of us and a glory that transforms us more and more into His image. So thank God for His glory today. We pray that God come and visit you in your home today with His presence, His manifested glory, that He bring change to where there needs to be change in your life. We appreciate our singers and our musicians and our tech people. So if you're on Facebook right now, just go ahead and give them a thanks. Send them up some hearts. Let them know that you appreciate them coming here every Sunday and ministering to us, leading us into worship with the living God. We want to welcome you this morning for joining us. Before we go any further, go ahead and share the live stream. Go ahead and create a watch party. Tax some people, however you got to do it. Get the word out there that we are online right now. And we're going to be preaching the word of the living God to you. I want to thank everybody for watching us. If you are a guest, first time joining in on our online community, we want you to let us know that you're here. You could just let us know right there on Facebook or YouTube. Let us know it's your first time here. Let us know where you're from. And um, everybody right now, just go ahead and start making some comments. Let us know that you're on with us. Send up, up some hearts and some thumbs up. Just let us know that you've joined us today. We'd appreciate that. If you are a guest first time on our online community, we want you to connect with us by texting us on your smartphone the word guest to 203-403-2529. When you do that, we're going to immediately respond with a text back to you. We're going to welcome you to the NBCC online community. But if you do text that word guest to us, to 203-403-2529, there's going to be a prayer request that you're able to use right now on your smartphone and text in a prayer request to us. If you have a need in your life, if you need God to intervene somewhere in your life, text that prayer request in. My wife, Pastor Gail, and myself will be praying this week for the prayer requests that come in. So... Go ahead and do that. It's a privilege for us to bring those needs into the presence of God. And we'll be doing that this week. Also, if you haven't downloaded the NBCC app, now is the time to do it. Go to your Android store, your Apple store, and just go ahead and put in there NBCC app. Download the app or go in text on your smartphone NBCC Darien app, NBCC Darien app <clears throat> to 77977. We send out important messages to our online community through that app, so it's important to stay tuned and stay connected. You can also give your offering, you can connect with us on, on live stream, you can do many other different things, do your Bible reading, Bible studies, open up to commentaries. It's a really great app. You want to have it on your smartphone, um, especially because it's the primary way we connect with our church people. So anyway, download that app. And by the way, if you do follow us on fake Facebook, make sure that you go in and give us a review on Facebook. We have so many new people on our online community. <clears throat> go to Facebook and rate us with those five stars, you know what I'm saying? And just give us a good review and let us know what you're thinking about NBCC. Please do that. Uh, what else do we have here? If you haven't yet joined our NBCC uh, prayer group on Facebook, you can do that as well if you're part of our online community. And uh, we'll be asking you a question. Are you part of the online community? Let us know that you are. We'll accept you onto our private prayer page. So uh, what you could do is pop in NBCC Prayer <clears throat> on Facebook search, and you could send in a request to be part of our community. Last Wednesday, my wife and I had an incredible time joining with you and sharing and exhorting and then praying together. 
it's really a great opportunity that we have to come together, my wife and I, and be able to share our hearts with everybody. So we'll let you know when the next prayer meeting will be. Also, if you are part of our online community and you are in need of food, don't be shy. Don't feel like you can't ask. Please let us know if you are in need of food. We will get food to your house if you can't go out. We'll help to provide food for you. So what you have to do is you have to text a keyword on your smartphone. Text COMMUNITY. COMMUNITY to 203-403-2529. 25-29. Let us know if you are in need and we will come alongside of you and assist you. So we're going to go ahead and take just a quick moment before we get into the Word. And we're going to um, go ahead and honor the Lord with our offering. I so want to thank everybody for your faithfulness and your continued generosity in giving to the Lord, especially during these tumultuous times that we are in. And honoring the Lord and putting your faith out there and sowing your seed and keep on putting the Lord first in your finances. You cannot go wrong with putting God first. Whether in time of prosperity or in time of famine, always keep the Lord first in your finances. Sow seed when you can, but especially your tithe. Honor the Lord with your tithe and God will make sure that He provides for you. Regardless of what it looks like around you, God is going to come through and be the one that provides for you. He's Jehovah Jireh. That means that God sees ahead before there ever is a need. The God who sees, Jehovah Jireh, He sees and He provides. He sees ahead before your need and already, already makes provision for you. So today, as we sow our seed and honor the Lord with our offering, we put our trust and hope in Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God that sees ahead and makes provision. Thank you so much for giving. You could do it by the NBCC app. You could text NBCC Darian to 77977. You could go to our website and you could give on the give button over there on the top side, right hand side of the NBCC org website but again thank you so much and if you are giving cash please just come down between Tuesdays and Fridays 9 to 3 and you could drop off somebody will be here to receive that offering again thank you so much for your faithfulness let's go ahead and get into the Word of God go ahead and share the live stream please a few weeks ago I preached a message that I titled quarantined in the house of blood and it was really a profound message for the body of Christ not just our church but for the church at large but since I released that message I've been pondering often since that time about the power of the blood or the power of the blood covenant when they applied that blood on their homes that day it was very significant that they did it exactly how God gave them the instructions to do it. And the Bible tells us that when God saw the blood, that the death angel had to pass over the house. No harm came to them. The blood represents the covenant that God had with his people. The covenant that he established many years prior with his covenant partner, Abraham. And so I've been pondering about this power that is in the blood and understanding the blood covenant. And so what I want to do is I want to dig and drill down just a little bit deeper on the significance of the blood in Scripture. And today I want to give you the introduction to the blood covenant. The blood covenant is one of the most important topics concerning our Christian faith because the whole of our redemption and our relationship with God actually hinges on blood. You know, the casual Christian understands that we do have a relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. The casual Christian understands that it's through the Son 
that we come to know who the Father is. But many people don't understand is that this relationship that we have with God is based upon a covenant. Come on. Everybody say covenant. A covenant that was cut with blood. And through this covenant, we not only have access, access, covenant gives us access. We not only have access into a relationship with God Almighty, but that covenant also becomes the basis of all the rights and privileges that come along with our redemption. So we can confidently say that the blood covenant is the underpinning of our faith. We really can't understand faith. We really can't have vibrant faith until we understand the blood covenant. In other words, we have a lot of people trying to operate in faith but they don't realize that the basis or the very foundation of their faith is rooted in blood. It's rooted. My faith is rooted in blood. If I don't have an educated understanding in biblical knowledge on this blood covenant, it's going to hinder my faith. I won't have life-giving, vibrant, conquering faith. I must understand what my faith rests upon. It rep rests upon a blood covenant. So when we understand the blood covenant, it brings assurance. It brings assurance to our faith. It's important to understand this one thing about God. Now, I'm not trying to put God in a box. you got to understand that. He is the sovereign God. And anytime we try to put him in a box, we're going to be very surprised that God cannot be put in a box. He cannot be contained. But even though God is a sovereign God, the scriptures are very clear to us in how he relates to mankind. God only relates to all human beings based upon covenant. God chose for it to be that way. So God placed his own limitations in how he interacts and how he relates to mankind. It's based upon a covenant. In other words, everything that he does has its roots in covenant. How could I say that? Well, I could say by pointing this out that Jesus shed his blood for the entire world. We all know that. God sends his son into the world, John 3.3, 3, into the world so that whosoever believes on him would have eternal life. And whoever does not believe on him is damned. So when we understand that Jesus shed his blood, he shed his blood for every human being, for the whole world. His blood is shed, the Bible teaches us, it is the blood of a new covenant that he enters in with us. The Bible teaches us that he is the mediator of this new covenant, but he mediates the covenant on behalf of all mankind, everybody, sinner or unbeliever, it doesn't matter. So the very fact that God mediated a covenant with his son and this covenant can cover the entire human race, that tells me that God relates to the whole human race based upon this covenant that he cut with his son as a mediator. And his son represented the human race. Come on now, we're going somewhere. Therefore, God only deals with man, both saved and unsaved, based upon a blood covenant. Those who have entered in to the covenant and complied to his covenant, well, they receive the blessings 
of the covenant. But listen, those who have not entered into the covenant nor complied to this covenant, instead of blessing, the Bible teaches they receive what we know as the curse of the covenant. Come on now, I'm preaching a truth right here. The covenant that God makes is available to all human beings, whether you're saved or unsaved. God relates to the human race based upon this covenant. Those who have entered into the covenant receive the blessing of the covenant that he mediated for us. Those who have not complied to the covenant nor entered into the covenant, they receive the curse of the broken covenant. And Ephesians chapter 2 kind of gives us an indication of what that is. We don't have it up on the overhead, so we're not going to show it to you. But Ephesians 2 says that they, those who have not complied to the covenant, come on now, the outsiders, the ones who have not entered into this covenant, they become strangers of the covenant of promise. And then it says in Ephesians 2, they are sons of disobedience. They are even children of wrath. Now this ain't Old Testament. Folks, this is New Testament. The ones who have not entered into the covenant, they're children of disobedience. They're strangers to the covenant of promise. They're children of wrath. And then the last part of it in Ephesians 2 says, having no hope. And without God in this world. That's some serious stuff. That is some serious stuff. That's in the New Testament. So when you comply and enter into the covenant that Jesus mediates, you receive the blessings of the covenant. And there are many. If you don't comply and you don't enter and you're an outsider to the covenant, you are without hope and without God in this world. And in strong words, we're children of wrath. I'm going to mention that word in a couple of more minutes. I want to talk to you a little bit about the blood covenant. Let's begin to unpack this just a bit. When we talk about the blood covenant, the roots go way, way back to the beginning of time. The blood covenant actually is the most sacred of all covenants that can be cut could be traced in every culture and society from the very beginning of time. Today in our Western culture, we really have no idea about the force and the strength of a blood covenant. You know, today we use the word covenant, but we don't even use that word. But if we do use the word it doesn't stir up our blood the way it would with somebody in the ancient world, in the ancient culture that understood the blood covenant. Today, if we do happen to use the word covenant, it's just another way of saying agreement or promise or even an association with someone or something. We call it a covenant. To speak about a covenant that is based on blood would actually not really sound good or be received in this day and hour that we live in. Talking about a blood covenant, that sounds a little weird, barbaric. I mean, gory when you start mentioning blood. But when you take the blood out of the covenant, the covenant loses its strength. And it makes that covenant, it no longer makes it serious. It kind of waters down the promises. And the reason why is because the blood speaks about the life of the person or the people that are in the covenant. In fact, Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. So when we talk about a blood covenant, like they practiced in the ancient world, it was a sacred covenant because it spoke about the life of man. It spoke about blood. The covenant was cut in blood. 
And the scope of that is wide. And the depth of that goes very deep in what a blood covenant is all about. And it's very, very strong, this type of covenant. But today, in our day and age, we just use the word promise or agreement or, you know, we're associated with a group of people. But no, not in the ancient world when blood covenants were made. And so let's talk a little bit about the significance of blood in the Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation, you could clearly see this scarlet thread being woven throughout the Old Testament all the way into the New, even into the book of Revelation. And in the Old Testament, one could not even approach God unless it was through blood, through the shedding of blood, under the Old Covenant. In other words, there was no atonement in the Old Testament. There was no atonement for sin unless first innocent blood was shed. Come on. The blood was so sacred to God in the Old Testament that it even had the power to communicate with God. For instance, in Genesis chapter 4, after Cain killed his brother Abel, God said to Cain, the voice of your brother, your brother's blood cries out unto me from the ground. That's what God said to, to Cain. The voice of your brother who you killed, the voice of his blood is speaking to me from the ground. So God hears blood. Then in Genesis chapter 8, after the great flood, Noah, Noah offered sacrifices to the Lord. And then God, that says, the Lord smelled the sweet savor of that sacrifice that was being burned and the blood that was mingled with that sacrifice. God smells the blood. And so God hears the blood. He smells the blood. And then when you get to Exodus 3, remember when we taught quarantine in the house of blood? In Exodus 3, it says that God sees the blood. So he not only hears the blood, he smells the blood. Exodus 3 said God sees the blood. Do you remember when the Hebrews were delivered from Egypt? God says, apply the blood to your homes. And when I see the blood, he's looking for the blood. I will pass over or I will hover over and protect your house and the death angel will not enter in. Man, God, he hears the blood, he smells the blood, he sees the blood. The blood is so sacred to God because in the Old Testament, the blood was offered as a payment for the sin of his people. See, the only way that God could offer the human race a new beginning, an eternal life, it had to be with the shedding of blood. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, and that means there's no absolving there's no pardoning or forgiveness of sin unless there is the shedding of blood. And so back there in the Old Testament, the blood of animals was a substitute for the blood of man. Did you get that? The blood of animals was a substitute for the blood of sinful man. Sinful man could not offer his own blood. But the blood of the animal was innocent. It was separate from the sin of man. So there was a substitute for the blood of the animal for the sin of the man. So God required blood to be shed to atone or to pardon the sins of his people. And folks, in the Old Testament, this was a daily occurrence 
in both the tabernacle and also in the temple. There was this constant flow of blood in the Old Testament. Blood was always on the brazen altar or flowing from the brazen altar. The blood of the sacrifice on behalf of the blood that was guilty that flowed through the veins of man. And I want you to get this because in the Old Testament, it's very important why God did this. He did this in the Old Testament to show them what would come in the future. It was like a picture lesson to them over and over and over again. Every sacrifice that was made on behalf of the sins of his people... It was a foreshadow of what would come, something in the future. A foreshadow is an indication. God would show them something beforehand or something that would happen in the future. We all understand that a shadow has no substance, right? I mean, the shadow, it's not even real, There's nothing tangible to a shadow. The shadow is only a projection of something that you're not seeing in the moment. You're looking at a shadow, but it means that there's a substance that is casting that shadow. And so in the Old Testament, every sacrifice whose blood was shed on the behalf of sinful man was a shadow, but the substance had not yet come. It would point to the future when, in the day when the Son of God would be the sacrifice. So they were just pictures. They were, it was a lesson for them. God was teaching them something that would happen prophetically in the future. And so every sacrifice, every moment that blood was shed on the brazen altar... It pointed to the ultimate sacrifice of the Son of God. Now, let's go a little deeper. Hebrews 10 tells us. Hebrews 10 tells us. Looking back in the Old Testament, it tells us this. The blood of animals. The blood of the animals in the Old Testament. This is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Could never take away sin. Could never take it away. Could never absolve it. In other words, it was a temporary solution in the Old Testament. When the blood of the innocent animal was shed on behalf of the guilty blood of the sinner. It was a temporary solution. Here it says the blood of the animals could never take away the sin permanently. It was temporary. Because it was a signpost pointing to the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus Christ whose blood would be shed in our place. And then he would be able to pardon our sin. And forgive us and atone for us. Look at 1 John 2.2. New Testament. He, speaking of Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins. Here it is. For the sins of the whole world. Did you see that? That's very clear. That Jesus is the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice, the sacrifice that will pay the price of sin because sin creates a debt. A debt that must be satisfied. And so Jesus is the atoning sacrifice. The sacrifice that pays the debt that was created because of our sin. Not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. See, God has a covenant. That he mediated through his son Jesus on behalf of the whole world. Does that mean that the whole world is in covenant with God? No. We must enter into the covenant by faith through Christ. And when we do not enter into the covenant, 
that God has cut with the whole world through the mediation of his son, then we are children of wrath. Come on now. you got to see this is so serious. God deals with the whole human race based upon this blood covenant. And so Hebrews chapter 5, 10, verse 5 and 6. Remember now, the blood of animals could never, ever take away the sin. It pointed to Jesus who one day would absolve us of our sin. Hebrews 10. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said, and now he's going to quote. The writer of Hebrews is quoting what Christ said when he came into the world. It's a quote from Psalm 40. So listen, this is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. That's a messianic psalm talking about when Christ would come. And he says this, you do not want the animals' sacrifices. They were all temporary. They were not fixing the problem. That was not the solution. It was just signposts, foreshadows. Come on. When Christ comes into the world, he says to his father, you do not want these sacrifices of animals offered for sin, but you've given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with the burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. In other words, it never satisfied God. But everything was pointing to the day when Christ would come and offer his body. Come on now. The wages of sin is death. That means a life is required for the sin. It's either our life or the life of a substitute. If you and I pay for our own sin, we're done. Finished. I mean, it's over for us. Forever we will be banished from the life of God for all of eternity. If we have to pay for our own sin. In the Old Testament, the substitute was again that sacrificial animal. It was either the life of that animal or it was the blood of the guilty. Come on now, do you see it? So the blood of the innocent may temporarily appease the justice of God. Temporarily appeased the justice of God but could not forgive sin but God looked at it as a temporary pardon. Man, only temporary until the substance of the shadow appeared. Until the real deal came. And Jesus becomes the true substitute. He is the body that would be offered. His blood would be shed. His life would be given. Man. Look at Romans 5 and 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Woo, I'm telling you, that gets my attention. When I read that, man, it makes the, the hair on my arm just stand up. Did you hear what that said? Since we've now been justified by his blood... How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Do you know what that's saying? It's saying the blood saves us from God's wrath, from the wrath of God. Come on now. We only want to confine the wrath of God to the Old Testament. No, look it. This is in the New Testament. We are saved from something. We are saved from the wrath of God. Do you see that? So our salvation is when you are saved by God from the wrath of God. In other words, by the blood, God saves you from himself. God saves you from himself. He not only saves you by his blood, but he also saves you from himself. The wrath of God. 
I'm telling you, wrath comes from being outside of the covenant. Even Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he that believes will be saved. He that does not believe will be damned. Man, there's so much to this that we could talk about, but I'm moving on. But if you're watching today and you're not sure whether you are a believer in Christ, a Christian or not, whether you're in the covenant, the blood covenant with God that Jesus the Christ mediated on your behalf, if you're unsure, don't tune out now. Don't, don't leave the live stream now, I beg you, because there's hope. There's hope, and it could change in just a moment. So hang in there. Let me give you the basic definition of the word covenant. It's an agreement or contract between two parties. Could be between two people, family, tribes, nations, wherever you want to apply that. To do or to refrain from certain acts. So it's a promise to do something or refrain from something. But a blood covenant goes deeper because the blood is involved. The Hebrew word for covenant actually signifies. Listen, the Hebrew word for covenant indicates blood being shed. Because it's the Hebrew word berith. And berith means to strike or to cut. It's where we, we get the term strike an agreement. Come on now. The Hebrew word means to strike an agreement or cut an agreement. So it signifies that blood will be shed in covenant with the Hebrew word covenant. See, they understand blood covenants. In the ancient world, it means to cut where blood flows or to cut until the blood flows. I want to go back real quick to the very beginning of history in the Garden of Eden so that we could begin to find some traces of blood. So follow along with me. The story of Adam and Eve. We know the story. They sinned against God. They experienced the separation, the repercussions of that sin. What was once a safe environment for them was now induced with fear, torment, uncertainty. They were plagued with guilt and shame. The Bible says that when they sinned, their eyes were open. They knew that they were naked. They knew that they violated God. And in their fallen nature, Adam and Eve did what pretty much is an instinct to what we all do. We grab for the closest thing to cover up our nakedness. Or to try to hide behind something that will fix the way that we feel because of our guilt. And this is what they did. The first thing they grabbed for to hide behind was the fig leaves. Remember? The leaves of the forest. And in Genesis 3 verse 7, they sewed fig leaves together. They made coverings for themselves. They hid behind the fig leaves. God comes on the scene. It's in there in the text. Basically, God comes on the scene and he says, your own efforts to vindicate yourself has failed. There's nothing that you could do to rectify your actions. This is what God Almighty is saying to Adam and Eve. He says basically to them, you can't make yourself right. You will fall short of it. Your sins have caused you to die. That was the repercussion. God was basically saying to them, if you're ever going to be made right, it's going to have to come from something that I do. You get that? His efforts. And so because God was not willing to just forsake his creation, he covered their sin. How did he do it? He did it right there in the garden with innocent blood. So the first sign that we see about the blood of the innocent being shed for the blood of the guilty is in the Garden of Eden. It says in Genesis 3.21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. God did it. God did it. 
What does this have to do with the blood covenant? The garments of skin, they were skins of animals. There were no skins just hanging out in the garden. But there were animals, live ones, cute ones. I mean, ones that you would take into your home or build a sh uh, backyard farm. Those kind of cute animals. And so the Bible says that God made them garments of skin. How did he do that? God, however he did it, he killed. He killed. He killed. He killed the innocent animal. He shed the blood. And again, the first picture of innocent blood being shed for the spiritual crimes of man. And again, it's a foreshadow. The innocent blood was a substitute for their blood. It was to atone their sin. They should have paid the price themselves. And if they did, they'd be banished from God for all of eternity. So God took the blood of the substitute and hid their sin. Then he took the skin of the animals and hid their nakedness. He not only went to the root, but he took care of the fruit as well. The blood covered their sin. The skin now covers their nakedness. And the blood that was shed saved them from the wrath of God. And Adam and Eve are now able to approach God based on blood. From this point on, this is how man approaches God. It's how God interacts with man. It's all based upon the blood. Not my goodness, not my, my niceness. It's based upon the blood because not one of us is totally innocent. Not one of us is totally innocent. We have the sin nature. We need the blood. We need a covenant with God. We didn't even do anything to enter into that covenant. God cuts the covenant with his son. His son's the mediator for you. He's the mediator for you and me. God cuts a covenant with himself. We enter into the covenant through surrendering to him, giving our all to him, giving him the reins of our life, making him the Lord of our life, complying with the covenant. And when we do, we can enjoy the blessings of the covenant. And so that's in Genesis, first sign. When you flip on to the next chapter, Genesis 4, we immediately see another sacrifice. And that's the sacrifice that Abel, Abel, Adam and Eve's son, Abel presents a sacrifice to God. So it's obviously that Abel learned something about the shedding of the blood to cover the sin. They learn Abel learned this from his mom and dad. Even though they didn't understand the whole mystery of what was happening, they understood that to approach God and to be absolved of their sin, they must go through blood. I don't know, maybe one day little Abel, you know, poked his head in his mom's closet and said, Mom, where'd you get them skins? That's nice, Mom. Where'd you get them? I don't know. Maybe his mom took him aside and said, let me explain something to you, Abel, where these skins came from. And gave him the whole story. Preached the gospel to him. The good news of how her and, her and uh, Abel's dad sinned and rebelled against God. And how their eyes were open, they hid among the shadows, they were terrified with fear. And God came along and took those fig leaves off of them and God initiated their salvation. Killed an innocent animal, Abel, right there in the garden. God stripped this animal of its skins and his, the blood of the animal covered our sin. And then the skins of the animal God gave us to cover our guilt and our nakedness. It's the gospel, man. It's the gospel. 
Real quick, as we bring this to a close, the heart of the ancient blood covenant. The blood covenant is basically the total commitment of the total life forever. Un of course, unless the covenant is broken. Blood covenants can be broken. But the blood covenant is meant to be a total commitment. All inclusive. All inclusive. Come on now, think about that. A blood covenant is not like, you know, an agreement we make when we go buy a car. We give the exchange of money to the dealer. They give us the car and we enter into an agreement. But when we do that, when we gave our money for the car, we didn't, we didn't own the, the building and the company. Come on. When that exchange happened, it was just for the car. That was it. It was just an agreement for the car. The, the scope of it was not the totality of the company and the totality of my life. But in the ancient world, the blood covenant, it covered everything. It was all inclusive. You didn't just make a blood covenant with one specific area of your life. It was the total life forever. It was all inclusive, a total commitment of the in total person. And everything attached to that person. Everything that belonged to one party belonged to another party. No subdividing, divvying things up like that. No, everything. If I were to cut a blood covenant with you, we are dealing with our whole lives. Not just one little subject matter. You own everything that I own. And I own everything that you own. Not just some of my assets. Listen, all of my assets are yours. And all of your assets become mine. But it also works in the negative as well. Not only that, but also all of my liabilities are yours. And all of your liabilities become mine. So it works for the good and for the bad. And not only that, but this blood covenant reaches beyond our lives to the lives of the next generation that follow us. Our children's children's children, children's children's children. And they are required to uphold the sacred blood covenant as well. The blood covenant was so sacred that if somebody broke it, if one party broke the covenant, they would be cursed. The curse would follow them all their lives. They would even be hunted down until they were killed. I mean, in some cultures, if the blood covenant was broken by someone, his own wife or own mother would hunt him down and kill him. That's how serious it was. My God. When you start examining and digging into the blood covenant, you'll find out that there's three major reasons why there was a blood covenant in the ancient world. First one was protection. When two tribes entered in to the blood covenant, the two leaders would come together. They would cut the covenant representing their tribes. And it just basically meant... The strength of that tribe now becomes the strength of this tribe. Even if this tribe was weaker, it didn't matter which one was stronger or weaker. The strength of the strong tribe would be now the strength of the weak tribe. The assets of the strong tribe would be the assets of the weak tribe. The fighting abilities of the strong tribe would be the fighting abilities of the weak tribe. If the weak tribe got attacked, the strong tribe would defend. If the strong tribe got attacked, the weak tribe would join forces with the strong tribe and they would attack back together. Man. So it was always, always had a place to be protected. The second reason would be for business. Two businessmen might cut a blood covenant and in this blood covenant, you would never 
You would never exploit my business, and I would never exploit yours. You would never take advantage of, even if we don't even have to be friends. Two businessmen that were enemies could cut a blood covenant with each other. And it was for each of their protection that not one would take advantage of the other. And then in the ancient world, we could see it clearly in the scripture, the blood covenant was cut with God and his people out of love. In the Old Testament, Israel had this love covenant with God. Israel belonged to God and God belonged to Israel. If you start looking at it in the Old Testament, you see all the covenant terminology. God said over and over to his people, I am your God, you are my people. Do you see that? That's covenant words. Covenant talk. He told Israel over and over again that he was married to them. Come on, that's covenant. Marriage. He knew, Israel knew that God was their husband. He was married to them. He was in this love marriage relationship with them. He constantly reminded his people, I belong to you and you belong to me. Covenant talk. But whenever Israel was unfaithful to the covenant, and oftentimes they were, whenever they broke this blood covenant that they had with God, the curse would come upon them. You know the stories. You know what's in the book. The curse of the broken covenant would come upon them until they repented. Until they repented and humbled themselves and came back to God. Back into the right relationship that they were supposed to have with God. Man, even in the Old Testament, there were times in the Old Testament God said, basically, He said, I divorce you. <sighs> Serious. Because of their unfaithfulness, God said that He was divorcing His people. Because of the broken covenant. My God, my God, we could go in a lot of places. But when we get this understanding about the strength of the blood covenant that we have with God, it changes everything for us. It strengthens and gives us confidence. It strengthens our faith. It gives us boldness before our enemy. I mean, it was in light of the blood covenant that David received courage to confront the giant from Gath. We know him as Goliath. Where did David get that courage from? It wasn't something he just mustered up on his own. Come on now, I don't have time to get into it, but I could prove it. David understood where his strength came from. He understood that when he confronted Goliath, he was not confronting Goliath alone. David understood when he stepped out to face that enemy that he had covenant rights and they came from God. Do you remember when David said to Goliath or said to the, the, the uh, soldiers before he faced the giant? He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Called him an uncircumcised Philistine. Why? Because in those days, circumcision was for the ones who were in covenant with God. It was a sign and a seal of their covenant they had with God. Blood covenant, by the way. And so when David came along and all the soldiers were freaking out in fear and intimidated, David said, who is this uncircumcised? Philistine that taunt, 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 taunts the armies of God. That's what he was saying. He's got no rights. He's outside of the covenant. Who is he thinking he is trying to harass the covenant people of God? And then when David faced off with the enemy, 
He said two important things to Goliath. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Covenant talk. In the name of someone who's got my back. I come not in my own name and my own strength and my own power. David said, I'm coming to you, Goliath, in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then David said this, the battle is the Lord's. It's covenant, man. Blood covenant words. David understood the blood covenant. He knew that he wasn't in this alone, that God was bound to have his back. God was bound to get involved in this battle. Even though David had to do something, he had to actively attack the enemy. He had to actively have a strategy. But God was the one who took down this giant. He runs up that hill with five stones in a sling, shouting his covenant rights. Goliath thought he was going to fight this little dinky guy, David. But he's about to stand off before God. God came all over that stone when he slung it towards Goliath. And that stone hit Goliath right in the center of his forehead. Knocked him down. David cuts off his head. It was based on the blood covenant. So when we are rooted in the blood covenant, we begin to meditate on what this really means with God and what it does for us. We'll never be afraid of that uncircumcised Philistine again. It comes to torment us and taunt us, cause us to cower in fear. And we have a covenant with God based upon blood. Come on now. And I'm ending with Romans chapter 8, this short verse of Scripture. And when I read it to you, I want you to listen for the tone of blood covenants. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up, for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we begin to drill deep into the blood covenant, open up our spiritual eyes to see, give us a revelation. A revelation of what you've done for us and the strength of the covenant that we enter in with you and what happens when we comply with this covenant. And help us to see, God, when we break the covenant and how to come back into the covenant and right standing with you. We thank you in advance for what you will teach us in the weeks to come. If you are watching on live stream right now and you're unsure of whether you're in this covenant with God or not, and you would be listening to this and say, I don't want to be labeled as a child of disobedience, a son of wrath, without hope and without God in this world. I don't want to be outside as a stranger of the covenant of promise and you want to get into this covenant with God, the safest place your soul could be where God forgives you of your sin and gives you eternal life, this is real, folks. He that believes on Him has eternal life. He that does not believe on Him, the last verse in John chapter 1 says, the wrath of God still abides upon Him. It could change right now. God wants you to enter into the love covenant He has with you. It's real easy. You could say this right now where you're at. In the confines of your own home, what safer place could you be in right now than in your house? If it's you, I want you to say with your words right now, God in heaven. Say it. Go ahead. God in heaven, I ask Jesus Christ, the one who died for my sin. Say that. 
I ask Jesus, the one who died for my sin, the one who mediated this covenant, I ask Jesus to come into my life and to be the Lord of my life. I want you to say this out loud because this is a covenant gesture. I want you to say this. Father in heaven, right now, I give you the reins of my life. I give them to you. Say this out loud. Say, right now, I decree I am not my own. I now belong to you. And now say this. Say, and now you, God, you belong to me. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin and giving me eternal life. Granting me the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let your spirit burn on the inside of me. Open up my spiritual eyes that I could see. The things I was never able to see before. Thank you for receiving me into your family. In Jesus' name, I pray amen and amen. I want you to do one more thing. I want you to tell somebody, tell somebody that you entered into a covenant with Jesus today. Tell somebody in your home, put it on Facebook right now in the comments. Text somebody that you know. Tell them right now that you have just entered into a covenant with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Folks, God bless you. We love you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And we'll be communicating with you when our next prayer time will be. And God bless you. We will see you right here next Sunday. Be blessed.